This is uh, George Abdenor, and I actually have videos uh, having to deal with neonatal respiratory distress, which is the most common problem that a pediatric radiologist is called upon to evaluate. Uh, you're probably going to get tired of seeing newborns during your rotation, but it is the bulk of our work. And I'm going to talk about neonatal respiratory distress. First, the various things we encounter, and in the second video, I'm going to talk about the complications of the treatment of that disease. And let me just start off by saying that my old boss, Dr. Poole, used to categorize neonatal respiratory distress into extrathoracic causes, thoracic causes, and intrathoracic causes. Obviously, the most common thing we deal with is the intrathoracic causes. And then she would divide those cases into medical disorders and surgical disorders. And then, of course, you can subdivide medical into cardiac and pulmonary. So that's the approach we're going to have. And the most important thing is to try and ballpark it into one of those areas. So this first case is just a normal neonatal chest radiograph. Uh, the baby's well-centered. He's not rotated. The lungs are the same density. You see fairly sharp vessels on both sides. Uh, this is a normal neonatal chest. And if you haven't uh, heard it already, if you see ossification of the, pros of the uh, head of the proximal humerus, that tells you that it is a term baby. If you don't see it, it doesn't tell you whether they're premature or term. This is also another normal neonatal chest. Uh, the baby's intubated, so he obviously is having problems, but it's probably central in origin. He may have a problem with his brain, maybe have a bleed, because his heart looks fairly normal and his lungs are pretty much clear. Uh, I would just add this one because you'll see this often, especially in term babies, and it's a normal anatomic finding. It is called the ductus bump. It is not the aortic arch. Uh, for you to see the aortic arch in a newborn, it would have to be an extremely abnormal aortic arch. So in the first week of life in term babies, you'll often see this little bump, which is continuous with a descending aorta, but that's exactly what the ductus is. So it's a normal anatomic finding. Uh, that you'll often see. This is another normal chest. Again, the, the lungs are fairly symmetrically aerated, uh, normal cardiothymic silhouette, and there's the ductus bump, another normal neonatal chest. Okay, during your pediatric rotation, you're probably going to hear me say it many, many times, but Evaluation of the degree of inspiration and rotation is completely different in children, especially in newborns. Uh, if you want to evaluate rotation in a newborn or an infant, you really need to just look at the ribs. You know, pick any part of the chest you want and measure from either the, the central portion of the vertebral body or the lateral portion, doesn't matter, to the inner or outer margin of the ribs. And those measurements, measurements should be exactly the same if the patient is totally not rotated. This is a hyperlucent hemithorax, but it probably is a result of the patient's rotation to the left. There's no reason to suspect an underlying pneumothorax, which I'll say more about later. This is another normal, relatively normal newborn. He's got mild lung disease, but he's rotated significantly to the right. And this is just to, to remind you that you're not used to seeing these, but you'll often see them on a rotated patient. These are the sternal ossification centers, and they should not be confused with anything other than that. It's a normal anatomic finding. The other big issue in assessing uh, the chest x-ray, especially in newborns, but infants as well, is whether or not it's a good inspiration or not. And this is as good an example as any of, if, if, if you count posterior ribs like you get taught to do with adult radiology or in older kids, teenagers, if you can't post your ribs, you're going to be wrong as far as assessing whether it's a good inspiration or not. If you notice, this diaphragm is between the, the, the 10th and 11th posterior rib. You might want to call that a good inspiration, but it's not. If you really want to assess inspiration in newborns and infants, you've got to count the anterior ribs, and I'm talking about the ossified portion of the anterior rib. should be above the diaphragm. So here's one, here's two, here's three. The fourth anterior rib is pretty much going a little bit below the diaphragm. A good inspiration counting anterior ribs in babies is five to six anterior ribs. 
If you count posterior ribs, you're going to be wrong more often than not. This is an image to explain why it's much more accurate to relate the diaphragm to the anterior ribs than to the posterior ribs. And the reason is, is uh, because of the configuration of the chest and how a lot of children are sort of generally shot lordotic. So if you imagine the x-ray beam coming in more or less perpendicular to the uh, x-ray film, you'll see that the apex of the diaphragm, only the couple millimeters that the beam is tangential to, that's so that, that diaphragm will project at this anterior rib level and this posterior rib level. If you have a beam that comes in more lordotic, if you'll notice, the diaphragm still projects at almost the same anterior rib level, but now it's moved up two or three posterior rib levels. And that is the reason why you'll never be wrong if you relate the diaphragm to the anterior ribs and not the posterior ribs. A good inspiration in a, in a newborn or infant or even an older child or for that matter an adult, there should be five or six anterior ribs and I'm referring to the ossified portion of the rib being entirely above the diaphragm. If the fourth or fifth rib is like partially below the diaphragm, I'll call that like four and a half anterior ribs. So a good inspiration counting anterior ribs is five to six and ignore the posterior rib level because this is where you'll be wrong. Uh, again, this diaphragm sort of projects almost in the same anterior rib level, but much higher for the posterior rib level. And that's the reason why you should not count posterior ribs, especially in newborns and infants. Okay, when I started, when I started off talking about differentiating medical from surgical diseases, the main aspect of any medical disorder, whether it's pulmonary or cardiac, is the lungs tend to be involved in a symmetrical fashion. When we get to surgical, there'll be asymmetry of aeration of the two lungs, often with mediastinal shift, although not necessarily. So here's a one-day-old baby with respiratory distress, and you have to sort of take the heart out of the picture and realize that he has fairly symmetrical central interstitial infiltrates this is what you would see with a classic TTN, or I like to call it wet lung syndrome. I'm probably a fossil by using that term. Uh, but TTN, or wet lung syndrome, is a, is a self-limited uh, entity. They're usually t symptomatic for uh, 12, 24 hours, rarely 48 hours. Again, the lungs are involved in a symmetrical fashion, but just be aware that this pattern, this pattern of perihilar interstitial infiltrates can also be seen in congestive cardiac disease. In fact, my old boss actually used to say, technically, whenever you use the term TTN, you should say versus congenital heart disease. I choose not to do that because it just gets too, uh, too cumbersome. Yeah, you because know, you don't have to have a big heart to have congestive heart failure, depending on what the underlying cardiac lesion is. All right, this is another, this is another patient with the same problem, except now you can see there's a small right pleural effusion. See, that's not the rib, that is a small pleural effusion. Even though the angle is sharp inferiorly, they're actually small bilateral pleural effusions. And when you see a pattern of perihilar interstitial infiltrates uh, with small effusions, it's usually going to be TTN. I'll also add the caveat that neonatal pneumonia can pretty much look like almost anything it looks like. The most classic appearance is just similar to hyaline membrane disease. If you ever see a, a, a newborn baby that looks like hyaline membrane disease but he has pleural effusions, they probably have neonatal pneumonia. I don't, e I don't even actually have a case of proven neonatal pneumonia in this PAC system as of yet. All right, there's another term term baby, because you can see the ossification center. A little bit more extensive perihilar infiltrate, some more obvious right pleural effusion, mm, a little bit on the left maybe. So again, this is either TTN or less likely pneumonia. This is a little bit more extensive disease. You can see interstitial markings all the way out to the periphery. There's a more obvious right pleural effusion. Even though it's got a lot of thymic tissue, the heart still looks fairly prominent. There's nothing against this being a case of of congenital heart disease, of a congestive t kind of pattern with some pulmonary edema. But I actually have a follow-up on this patient. 
This is the same patient less than 24 hours later, and you can see there's been significant clearing, and obviously congenital heart disease would probably never do that no matter how much medical intervention uh, uh, might occur. So the, pedi the neonatologist, I can guarantee you, generally know when they have a baby that has TTN versus congenital heart disease because clinically they improve relatively dramatically within 12 to 24 hours as well. And there's really no reason to even do a follow-up x-ray most of the time. This is another patient who has a relatively awful looking x-ray, but the baby really wasn't that symptomatic. He certainly was tachypnic. And again, the heart's mildly enlarged. He's got perihilar and lower lobe infiltrates. I don't see much in the way of effusion, but you don't have to see that. So again, the reading of this radiograph would be TTN versus pneumonia. This is that patient's same uh, follow-up film, less than 24 hours. He still has some prominence of his interstitial markings going all, all the way out to the periphery, but significant dramatic improvement like that pretty much you know, confirms uh, this being a case of TTN and certainly not congenital heart disease.